Chapter 9. Misinterpreting God's Mail. Israel's Prophetic Future. John 1.11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Christ came to his own, that is the nation of Israel, the Jews, but they rejected him. Such a truth with such profound implications. In fact, the far-reaching ramifications of this passage seem almost inestimable. Unfortunately, the Jews rejected him in birth, in life, as well as in death. God's light directly shone down upon this little nation, yet they repeatedly chose to walk in their own darkness. Isaiah prophesied as much when he wrote in Isaiah 9, 2, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. For well over two millennia, the best characterization of Israel's spiritual eyesight is abject blindness. When Israel rejected the light and refused to believe on Christ, John 9, 5 and John 12, verse 46, the nation put on hold their recovery from spiritual darkness. Regardless of Israel's present difficulties and their spiritual state, God has graciously promised to again cause his face to shine upon them. This is the principle found in Matthew chapter 13, which shows that those who reject divine revelation are given no further light until the initial light is accepted. This truth is plainly set forth in Matthew 13, 10 through 15, where Jesus explained his use of parables. The Jewish nation had rejected the kingdom and later in Matthew chapters 26 and 27 would reject the king. Light rejected yields darkness. Christ's work of restoration began at his incarnation. The national restoration never came to fruition because of Israel's rejection of their Messiah. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. One day Israel's restoration will be consummated when Christ physically returns to establish his millennial kingdom following the time of Jacob's trouble. That is Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Isaiah prophesied of Israel's future state of blessing as the arrival of light and the rising of God's glory. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. God's prophetic calendar, especially as it pertains to Israel, is set in stone. Yet the Jews remain oblivious to these truths, much like when their Messiah appeared the first time. John 1, verse 41. John 4, verses 25 and 26. These future events will commence with Daniel's yet-to-be-fulfilled 70th week, which begins after the church's departure. The events prophesied during this time will seem like an eternity to those on earth going through them, but it only lasts for one week of years, that is seven years. It abruptly ends with the arrival of Israel's king, King Jesus. The final chapters of Revelation offer a glimpse into Christ's return. Revelation 19.11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and righteousness he to judge and make war. When King Jesus returns, he will judge and make war with those who refused to repent. Revelation 9, 20 and 21, Revelation 16, 9. During the time of God's wrath, as the dust settles with Christ's enemies slain and the nations judged, the world will finally experience a righteous king ruling and reigning from his earthly throne. Church and state will then and only then be united in holy wedlock as King Jesus establishes the promised kingdom for the Jews. The chart on page 141 is titled, Thy Light is Come. The millennium will serve as a sampling of the joys of eternity that will follow thereafter. Truly, the future is bright for the Jews. However, at the end of the millennium, the world will have its final opportunity to choose between Christ's glorious rule and the individual self-will. After the thousand-year period of joy, peace, and righteousness concludes, the majority chooses to rebel against their Creator. God allows them to choose this path with the enemy, the devil, when he is loosed for a little season. Revelation 20, verse 3. One last time he will deceive the nations, but his success will be short-lived with his doom quick, complete, and eternal. 
Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. The Battleground. It would be wonderful to proclaim that these plain articulated prophetic truths settle the matter once and for all. Unfortunately, Israel's promised future serves the prime battleground for replacement theology doctrine. This false doctrine has historically resulted in doctrinal errors and even holy wars too numerable to enumerate in this work. Furthermore, the errors of replacement theology pertaining to Israel's future are far too numerous to delineate. For this reason, we focus our attention upon only three pertinent yet rhetorical questions. Number one, is the time of Jacob's trouble appointed for Jacob? Is Daniel's 70th week for Daniel's people, the Jews? Or is there no need of a time of trouble and purification of the Jews because God has long ago cast them away forever? Daniel's 70th week. The doctrine espoused by replacement theology teachers exposes their disingenuous nature and sheer hypocrisy. While most of these teachers seize upon the promises of Israel's future blessings, few commandeer Israel's future chastening. Regardless of the teaching, these two elements are both scripturally and logically inseparable. As we have seen, the replacement theology teacher is a flawed system on several fronts. He has been spiritually blinded in his quest to become heir to the Jews' blessings. Only those acting unethically usurp Israel's promises without taking ownership of the impending judgment looming in Israel's future. These so-called theologians fail to assume full responsibility for the pending judgment that results from the historical wrongdoings of the Jews. On page 142, the chart is titled, Daniel's 70th Week, Trouble and Purification. Regardless of the replacement theology teacher's claims, the next major prophetic appointment on Israel's calendar is just such an event. It is known as Daniel's 70th Week, Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, and Jacob's Trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, which will fulfill the Lord's pledge, I will correct thee, that is Israel, in measure, and will not leave thee, that is Israel, altogether unpunished. Jeremiah 30, verse 11. If the church in fact replaced Israel and usurped its blessings, the same teacher should teach that the church will also suffer Israel's fate through the judgment known as Jacob's trouble. If the church replaces Israel, God lied to them. Impossible. In order to dispel the notion that Daniel's 70th week is intended for the church, we must first consider this period of time and what the scripture has to say about it. Contextual study or line-upon-line line study quickly disproves replacement theology teaching. There are many methods to refute this false teaching, but the simplest are often the best. Consider these three things. Number one, the nature of Daniel's first 69 weeks. Number two, the stated purposes of Daniel's 70th week. And number three, the detailed blueprint of Daniel's 70th week. Number one, the first 69 weeks of years. The book of Daniel foretold of 70 purposeful weeks of years specifically appointed upon God's people. The Bible does not leave any room for private interpretation, 2 Peter 1.20. This time of correction is specifically appointed upon thy, that is Daniel's, people, Israel, and upon thy, Daniel's holy city, Jerusalem. Read the passage for yourself and see if you can find the church anywhere within its context or if the prophecy points specifically and directly to Israel. Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The text clearly identifies a division of time within the 70 weeks of 69 weeks, 7 weeks, and 3 score and 2 weeks. Daniel 9.25, and one week, Daniel 9.27. The first period, the 69 weeks, ends with the cutting off of Messiah the Prince, Daniel 9.26, and the latter period begins with the confirmation of a covenant by a different prince, small p, Daniel 9, verses 26 and 27. Before Daniel's first 69 weeks can be more fully understood, one must understand two foundational truths. Number one, these 69 weeks are historical in nature, easily proven from Scripture and by history. And, two, these 69 weeks reference weeks of years, or simply each week represents a seven-year period of time. Furthermore, we understand that Daniel's 69 weeks had a definitive beginning. 
Many have speculated concerning the commencement of this time period, but using the biblical text as one's authority offers only one definitive solution. According to Scripture, the weeks originated from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, Daniel 9.25, which corresponded with the building of the street and the wall, Daniel 9.25. Some have pointed to Cyrus's decree as the commencement, that is Ezra 1, 1 through 4, and 2 Chronicles 36, 22 and 23. Yet the biblical and historical evidence instead points to the commandment given to Nehemiah, Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 8. Unfortunately, the specific dates assigned by historians to this event vary by about a decade, but we can safely pinpoint them somewhere between 454 B.C., that is Usher, and 445 B.C., that is Reese and Anderson. Just as Daniel's 69 weeks had a defined and identifiable beginning, the scripture also pinpoints a definitive conclusion under Messiah the Prince, Daniel 9.25, and after the full 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off, Daniel 9.26. The precise timing during Christ's earthly ministry has been debated by Bible expositors. However, all agreed that these events referred to Christ's first coming. Daniel specifically noted the conclusion of this period as being related to the cutting off of Messiah, which occurred approximately A.D. 32. With these elements precisely established from Scripture, consider the approximated mathematical implications of Daniel's 69 weeks of years, realizing that the Gregorian calendar dates have discrepancies. The weeks begin, Nehemiah's commandment, approximately 450 B.C., the weeks end, Christ's crucifixion, approximately A.D. 32. The approximate time interval, 483 years. Historically, weeks were used to simply denote divisions of sevens, whether associated to seven days or seven years. These calculations, therefore, confirm that the 69 weeks were not weeks of days, but weeks of years. Thus, the testimonies of Scripture and history reveal that the weeks of Daniel were weeks of years as follows. Years from Nehemiah to Christ, approximately 483 years. Daniel's identified weeks, divide that by 69 weeks, and each week equaled in years is a seven-year period. Daniel's first 69 weeks were 69 seven-year periods, totaling 483 years. Interestingly, Daniel's prophecy contained another time marker and division within the 69 weeks. Daniel divided that time into seven weeks of years, followed by 62 weeks of years. This division suggests that some major event would happen seven weeks, Daniel 9.25, were approximately 49 years from the initial command given to Nehemiah in 450 B.C., what major event took place approximately 49 years after Nehemiah, or about 400 B.C.? The Charter 145 is titled, Daniel's Prophetic Focus. We know that the Old Testament's 39 books concluded about the same time, 400 B.C. This closure was followed by 400 years of silence until the onset of the New Testament with the birth of John the Baptist, followed by the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of the precise timing of the events, we know one thing with complete certainty. The Jews were the center of focus during all 69 weeks of years. This fact alone demonstrates clearly that Daniel's 70 weeks were not directed toward the church, but specifically, purposefully, and exclusively upon the nation of Israel. Daniel's prophecy is the culmination of God's judgment upon Israel, and the church has no right to usurp Israel's blessings and certainly no desire to appropriate her curses. Number two, Daniel's 70th week, its purpose. The historical account of Daniel's prophecy indisputably indicates its Jewish origin, nature, and scope. The seven stated purposes of the 70 weeks further confirm this Jewish nature and scope. These purposes include both Israel's future judgment and corresponding blessing. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, that is Israel, upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision, and, parentheses, and to seal up the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 
that part and to seal up the prophecy is added because it's understood by the previous part of the sentence. Verse 24 above delineates the seven stated purposes as summarized below. None of these seven purposes were fulfilled at the cross, nor during any time prior to the cross. Furthermore, the 70 weeks have absolutely nothing to do with the Gentiles or the church of God during the church age. These seven purposes are plainly and specifically determined upon the nation of Israel and Jerusalem and no other. Here they are again directly from Scripture, with number six being understood to be an extension of number five. Here it is. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision. Number six, to seal up the prophecy. And number seven, to anoint the most holy. The first three proclamations above refer to Israel's transgression, her sins, and iniquity. The final four refer to God's work of establishing everlasting and worldwide righteousness commencing with the nation of Israel. The first group involves removing of wrong, while the last grouping points to the institution of right. This sequence is common in the Bible. For instance, this scenario clearly parallels what we are told concerning Christ's work for all in Romans chapter 4. Christ was delivered for our offenses, the removal of wrong, and raised again for our justification, the institution of right, Romans 4.25. The born-again church-age saint, whether saved while a Jew or saved while a Gentile, already spiritually realizes that which is yet to be realized by the Jews nationally. Because of the cross and the Christian's personal faith in Christ's propitiation, we inwardly possess these blessings in the present. Christians rightfully cling to promises like, Now once in the end of the world hath he, that is Christ, appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, that is Christ. Hebrews 9.26 And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Daniel's pronouncements simply cannot apply to born again, saved children of God, because for us sin has already been put away, and reconciliation has already taken place. These events are national and in the future for Israel, but already a present possession for every Christian. In other words, these blessings are enjoyed by the individual Christian, but not yet collectively by the house of Israel. The Jews nationally have an appointed time, yet future, when God will bring these things to pass for them. This is the time prophesied in Hebrews chapters 8, 10, and elsewhere. Hebrews 8.10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more." In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Hebrews 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The Lord's return will bring to fruition this promised and prophesied covenant for the house of Israel. This is certainly not appropriated by the church, nor does it refer to an event that takes place at the Blessed Hope. In fact, it takes place for the Jews at Christ's second advent, Revelation 19.11. At that time, Christ takes his rightful seat on the throne in Jerusalem. It is only then that the Most Holy will be anointed as repeatedly prophesied by Daniel, Paul, and so many others. Daniel 9.24 The chart on page 148 is titled After Those Days. The chart on page 148 is titled After Those Days. In the future, the Jews will benefit individually, nationally, and physically from the same blessings now enjoyed by the New Testament saint individually and spiritually. This takes place when Christ returns following the conclusion of Daniel's 70th week. It is incomprehensible how so many fail to see this as Israel's future when God promised such and his men prophesied it. 
Number three, Daniel's 70th week, its blueprint. Grasping the prophetic blueprint for Daniel's 70th week is essential for every Bible student. The 70th week of years concludes what God specifically began concerning his dealings with the Jews. Understanding two central events, often misunderstood and misinterpreted, helps to establish the appropriate context. These are, number one, the introduction of a prince. Number two, the confirmation and eventual breaking of that prince's covenant with Israel. It is critical not to miss the fact that Daniel chapter 9 identifies two distinct and separate princes. The first is referred to as Messiah the Prince with a capital P, Daniel 9.25, or Messiah, Daniel 9.26, while the other figures referred to simply as the Prince, small p, Daniel 9.26. Interestingly, the primary distinguishing feature in Scripture between these two princes is one of orthography, a capital P versus a lowercase p. This simple truth reveals why it is so crucial not to allow any so-called Bible translator to mess with your Bible in the slightest, including even capitalization. These are crucial truths that the devil loves to erase. The simple truth is that the prince, small p, introduced in Daniel 9.26, discussed in Daniel 9.27, is not the Messiah the prince from Daniel 9.25. The prince of verses 26 and 27 is connected to the prince of Tyrus, Ezekiel 28.2. Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, Ezekiel 38.2. And the prince of this world, John 12.31, John 14.30, John 16.11. And the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. All of these references point to one figure, the prince of this world, the devil himself. Unfortunately, some Bible teachers have muddied the waters by applying these passages to an historic fulfillment. They apply them to either Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 B.C. or Titus in A.D. 70. Yet the greater context, along with the revelations found in the New Testament, exposes this error. As is often the case, prophecy can have a multifaceted fulfillment with a partial fulfillment historically. However, the scripture points to a time, yet future, when the devil, through the Antichrist, will unleash his fury on the Jewish people. The devil, being the great imitator of Christ, will show up in dramatic fashion and offer peace during the most troubling of times. The unsuspecting Jews and the world at large will be deceived by his flatteries. God's word has repeatedly prophesied this mass deception. We are told that the Antichrist, through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many, Daniel 8.25. This is how the Antichrist shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, Daniel 11.21. This peace comes in the form of a covenant with the Jews and satisfies the long-awaited peace accords. By all appearances, the Antichrist offers a treaty to the Jews, one promising seven years of peace and religious liberty. The Jewish sacrifices resume and all will seem authentic for the Jewish people. There will be much emphasis upon peace when there is no peace, Jeremiah 6.14, Jeremiah 8.11. Paul prophesied concerning this time period, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. The peace will be short-lived. Midway through Daniel's 70th week, three and a half years, things drastically change. Israel's covenant will be broken, and the Jews will suffer great calamity. Daniel 9, 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, that determined, shall be poured out upon the desolate. The transitional event during Jacob's troubles, identified as the overspreading of abominations in Daniel, and referred to as the abomination of desolation by Jesus, Matthew 24, 15, Mark 13, 14. This event takes place when Satan is cast out of heaven and the son of perdition sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4. As we will see with Michael's protection gone from that point to the end of Daniel's 70th week, the saints of the Most High are given into the hand of the beast. 
This period covers the time, times, and the dividing of time, Daniel 7.25, or three and a half years. Daniel 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, and times, and the dividing of time. The midpoint of Daniel's 70th week is the hinge upon which the door of the entirety of Daniel's 70th week swings. Literally, it is the point in time when the world completely begins to unravel, when all hell on earth breaks loose. Satan battles with Michael, ultimately finding himself cast from heaven to earth, Revelation 12, verses 1 through 10. At that point, Satan immediately enters the temple, and the abomination of desolation desecrates the temple, causing the Jewish sacrifice to cease and the Jews to flee to the mountains. It is important to note the role and position of Michael the archangel, Jude 9, which serves the key component in this end-time scenario. Understanding his position and work reveals some of the hidden mysteries of Daniel and Revelation. It also unlocks the historically skewed interpretations of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. At the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week, Michael, Israel's prince and protector, is removed to heaven to war against Satan. When Satan is cast to the earth, he unleashes his unrestrained wrath and fury upon God's chosen people left defenseless by Michael's departure. Footnote number one. For a more in-depth discussion concerning Michael and his role with the nation of Israel, see Reviving the Blessed Hope by the same authors, pages 91 to 99. This subject is also covered more extensively in When the End Begins by the same authors, pages 105 to 108. Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Satan takes full advantage of Michael's absence on earth. According to the context of Revelation chapter 12, his wrath will be directed toward the woman. Revelation 12, 1, verse 4, verse 6 verses 13 through 17, clearly identified as Israel, Genesis 37, 9. Note, the astute Bible student notices the peculiar absence of the church during this confrontation because she has been raptured to heaven. The context of Daniel chapter 10, linking Michael to Israel, points directly to the prophecy concerning the latter days. God appointed Michael to be the protector of the nation of Israel. In fact, Michael serves as Israel's prince. Daniel 10.13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Daniel 10, verse 20, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there's none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. It is important to consider the Bible's obvious association of Michael in Daniel chapter 10 to the figure alluded to and whose identity is hotly contested in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Daniel 10.21 says that none holdeth with me except Michael your prince, referring to Israel's prince. This key word holdeth helps to associate Michael with the prophecy of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which mentions, Now ye know what withholdeth. 2 Thessalonians 2.6 And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Footnote number two. The timing of the events of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of the most debated subjects of eschatology. For instance, the withholding, he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, have frequently been identified as the Holy Ghost departing with the church at the rapture. One of the problems with teaching this is that the timing of events do not work. Verses 6 and 7 point to the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week when the wicked desecrates the temple of God and not the beginning of the seven-year period. By the time the wicked is revealed, the church has been gone from earth for three and a half years. 
The holding back points to Michael holding back the full fury of Satan for the first three and a half years, which changes when Michael is summoned to heaven to cast Satan to earth, Revelation 12, 9. The one who withholdeth in Second Thessalonians is the same one that holdeth in the book of Daniel. For all of Israel's history, Michael has been protecting them and withholding Satan's fury toward God's chosen people. This status changes the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week when Michael is taken out of the way to fight the prophesied battle against Satan in heaven. These will certainly be troublesome days for the Jews. Daniel calls it a time of trouble, Daniel 12.1, and Jeremiah more specifically calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30 verse 7. Jacob's trouble may not refer to the entire seven-year period, but only when Israel's full vulnerability is exposed without their protector. Daniel 12.1 At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, the children of Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble, Jacob's trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people, Israel, not the church, shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Both Jeremiah and Christ stated that that day is great, with none like it. The book of Matthew points out that it will be a great tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Daniel 70 weeks, Michael the archangel, the abomination of desolation, all point directly to Israel. The devil, the Antichrist, the unbelieving Jews and Gentiles will join forces in an all-out assault on believing Jews and Gentiles, lasting 40 and 2 months, Revelation 11, 2, the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 8, 11, Yea, and he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said, Unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Revelation 11.2, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Those who subscribe to replacement theology place their beliefs in direct opposition to the will of God, the word of God, and the doctrines of God. Beware, because those who are doing so are touching the apple of his eye, Zechariah 2.8. They will stand accountable. On page 154, the chart is titled, Daniel's Prophetic Blueprint. Although one can commit this offense and obviously remain saved, this sin will cost the offender dearly at the judgment seat of Christ. Unfortunately, this false teaching has also led countless others to reject the gospel of Christ altogether. Christian, take heed how you build, because each of us must give an account for our work after salvation. 1 Corinthians 3.10 that is the end of chapter 9.